Open up your Bibles to Psalms 80. That's where we'll be today camping out. And uh, for this summer, we'll be in the book of Psalms. And uh, we're, our series is Experiencing God. And the greatest way to experience God is revival. Amen? Look at someone and say revival. Now look at someone and say, are you revived? Woo, got y'all preaching to each other this morning. Family, we need revival. Amen? We need to be restored. And so let's, let's look at the Word of God right here in Psalms 80. Uh, this is what the, uh, the psalmist of Asphus it, 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 it is, is writing down, um, inspired by the Holy Spirit. He says, Give ear. I'm going to say, Give ear. O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are throned upon the cherubim, shine forth. They want to say, Shine forth. And three other times he's going to talk about that the Lord would shine His face. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up. Everyone say stir up. Stir up. We ought to be asking the Holy Spirit to stir up. Amen? Your might. And come to save us. Everyone say save us. us. And then look at verse 3. He's going to repeat this three times. Restore us, O God. Let Your face shine that we may be saved. Look right here at verse 7. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let Your face shine that we may be saved. And then look at verse 19. He ends it with, everyone say, Restore us, O Lord, God of hosts. Let Your face shine that we may be saved. And all God's people said, Family, the church needs to be restored. As you all know, our nation is in great danger. We're, we're in great trouble like we've never witnessed in our lifetime. But family, the reason why this nation is in such great trouble and the reason why we're witnessing what we're seeing, not only in this nation but all over the world, is if there was ever a time the church needed to be restored, the church needed to be revived, the church needed to come to life, that time is now. Can I get an amen? Amen. Because that's what's wrong with this nation. Is the church... We need to be restored and brought back to life. And Rick, if you can do me a favor and and show this picture. If if y'all don't know Brother Paul, you you need to get to know Brother Paul. And and one of the things that that Paul does on his spare time is he finds cars like this that we would think is junk and that we would think just need to be completely scrapped and, and never dealt with again. Paul will find them and he looks at those cars. You know what he says? He says, I can bring those to life. And family, I want us to see something. And I want you all to see what the psalmist is trying to show us. This is the state of the church. And this was the state of Israel. Israel was upon dark times, was upon bad times. Israel had forgotten who the real shepherd was, who the real king was, who the real savior was. They have gone off and searched after other gods and other things. And and, and family, now the enemy was closing in. And and, and the psalmist who's writing this, he's desperate. And he's praying that his nation will become desperate like him to see God breathe on on their nation again and bring them to life again and save them. And family, this is what needs to happen with the church. And I I keep wondering, what has God got to do to put us on our knees? And to help us to see how desperate we are for Him in our marriage, in our life, in our family. Because what's happening is in the church, many of us family, you know what we're doing? We're looking at others. We're looking at those who don't vote like us, who don't look like us, who don't do church like us. And we're going, man, look at them. They they look like that car. And God is saying, hey, look at you. Because you look just like that. And family, we weren't created to look like that. Can I get an amen? And praise God that in His, in his providence, in His sovereignty, that, that He looks at that and goes, I, I, I choose to speak life. I choose to redeem. I choose to revive. That's what Paul's doing when he picks these cars. He doesn't have to bring this back to life, but he chooses to. And praise God that He wants to do the same for us. Amen? Because look at the next picture. <laughs> look at that! That was his wife's birthday gift. I know some of the ladies are elbowing right now their husband. Hey, did you see what did you hear what he just did for his wife? But look at that. You saw how the car used to look and now how it looks. 
And family, this is what the Lord Jesus wants to do with His church, His bride. We need to be restored. We need to be revived. Can I get an amen? amen? And so point one, family, if you're taking notes, point one, if we want to see the church restored, the church brought back to life, to, to what she's supposed to look like and be, family, is, is we need to realize, oh, shepherd, who our shepherd is, who, who the true king, who the tr true savior is. Can I get an amen? Amen. We got to know who he is, and we have to. He's. It's got to be him that we're crying out to. Can I get an amen? Because family, many in the church, we're not crying out to Jesus. Yeah. I've even heard people. I even had a a, 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 a pastor yesterday was telling me I, I can't celebrate Roe versus Way being overturned. It wasn't the right politicians I wanted, so I can't celebrate it. This is how jacked up the church has become. We, we base everything off of politics, off of who's in charge, who's the president. Did, did it come through, did it come through uh, socialism? Did it come through capitalism? Did it come through this? It, and we've forgotten who Jesus is. The real shepherd. Our real savior. The, the only one who can breathe life in the church and the only one who can breathe life into this nation. And we've got to remember who He is and we need to cry out to Him because look what it says right here in Psalms 1. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel. Notice who He's crying out to. The true shepherd. And He goes on. Who, lead, who you lead. Family, he's, our, he's the one who leads us. He's the one that leads the flock. We can't forget who the true shepherd of the church is. It ain't Billy. And it's not any other pastor in this church. It's Jesus. He is the true shepherd of this church and every other church that exists in this world. Can I get an amen? amen. He is the one who's enthroned. He is the one who shines forth. And family, we need Him to be stirred up once again because we need to see His power in the church again. Amen? So that we can be saved. And family, hear me on this. There is no revival without prayer. And the psalmist knows this. I got to cry out to the true shepherd. I got to cry out in prayer because that's the only way the church will be restored. That's the only way I will be restored. That's the only hope for my marriage. It's the only hope for my family. If I truly want to see revival, I must become someone who prays. Yeah. And family, I'm going to keep calling our church out until I see this place packed out when it comes to a night of prayer. I called us out three weeks ago. You know how many people showed up? 20-something. And can I tell you something? Majority of the leaders still are not showing up in this church for prayer. But yet we say we want to see people saved. We want to see the power of God ascend. And I continue to hear excuses, but you don't understand I have family. Well, so does everybody else who's showing up. But, but, but I have this. So does everyone else who shows up. You're, you're not the only one. Spurgeon says it well. We're busy about a thousand things, but the very thing we're not busy about is prayer. Coming together as the people of God. And family, can I tell you something? That's when God moves, when He sees His people come together. And that they're saying, hey Lord, you know what? I, I've come to realize what's more important than sports and anything else is we need to see you pour out. And do we truly believe that? Are we desperate? And, and family, I'll ask this, what has God got to do to make us more desperate? Because He's purging His church like I've never seen. I just came back from Cuba. He's doing the same thing there. He's doing it all over the world. He is purging His church. What must He do for us to fall on our knees and say, you know what, Lord? We put everything else aside and we're going to make prayer a priority because we need to see You move. Family, the first great awakening that took place came about through prayer. The second great awakening, they prayed for 40 years. 40 years. What does the word say? Do not grow weary in doing good. But in due time, you shall what? Reap a harvest. Why have we not seen revival? We're not willing to put the work in. We're not willing to pray. Family, Roe versus Wade. We just witnessed it overturned. Do you know how long people have been praying? 49 years. 49 years. People were praying for it to be overturned. Will we get busy about praying? Because they're saying right here in Psalms 2, look at right here, verse 2, stir up your might and come to save us. The family, God ain't getting stirred up if His people ain't on their knees praying. 
Study church history. Study revival. Study your Bible. It comes about through prayer. And notice, as they're praying, they're declaring the truths of God. We should always start off our prayer this way. This is how he starts off his prayer. Declaring the truths of God. Who's the true shepherd? Jesus. I mean, what does Psalms 23 say? The Lord is what? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not what? Want. Why are we wanting? Because many of us don't have Jesus as our true shepherd. We're letting, some, we're, we're letting many other things be the one that guides and leads. And we have to ask ourselves this morning, is Jesus truly king of our life? Lord of our life? Does He truly run our life? If many of us are honest, we're not trusting God right now and we're looking at everything else but Jesus to be the one who's running our life. He's the one who leads the flock. And then I love this because you're going to see this in the points. Then we notice, look right here again at verse 1. He says, O shepherd. Then look right here at verse 3. Restore us, O God. Then look at verse 4, O Lord. I want to say, O Lord. And family, it's important that we understand this word, O Lord. You'll see this throughout the Old Testament. And you see it in certain spots. But this is why it's important that we know the Hebrew. And family, this word, O Lord, he's not just, it's not like this type of prayer. O Lord. And then he just moves on. No, family, that oh Lord, we need to understand the emotions and the weight of that word. That, 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 is, that is a plea. That, that is a cry from desperation. Family, this psalmist, as, he, as he's saying this prayer, he's not just saying it quickly. No, family, he's on his knees. Oh Lord, oh God, give ear. He, and you can even say he's laying prostrate is what he'll say about this word. Like he, he's putting it all out. It, it, it's like Hannah and, and 1 Samuel when she's outside the temple and, and, and Eli thinks she's drunk. And she's not drunk. She's desperate for a move of God. And she understands the only way she's going to be, ever see a child come forth from her is unless God does something supernaturally. And she's at a point where she's just, oh Lord, crying out so much, it sounds like she's drunk. And do we sound like that? Are we like that in our prayer life? When we're crying out to God in our closet and we're crying out to God as a church? Because that's what the psalm is at. Oh Lord. That's why he says, oh shepherd. And so family, to see that the church restored, we need to, we got to remember who the shepherd is and we got to be crying out to Him. And then point two, everyone say, oh Lord. We repent. And family, what the psalmist is going to do. He, he's going to repent. And he's praying that the nation will repent. And this is because look right here at verse 4. He says, Oh Lord. And no, this is a cry from on the knees. Or he's just literally laid out. God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? The psalmist is like, what's going on? We're crying out. We're repenting. We're, like, are we, like, God, how long will you be angry with us? We understand that our sins are great. And then look at verse 5. You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us an object of contention for our neighbors and our enemies laugh among us themselves. You see, God was fed up with the sin of Israel. He was fed up with them sacrificing the children. He was fed up with them abandoning their marriage. He was fed up with them with their unbelief and, and worshiping other gods. He was fed up with, oh, things aren't going right. Let's cry out to God. Oh, God just blessed us. Let's go back to our sin now. He was fed up. He was angry. And he was bringing in enemies who were invading Israel and they were bringing great harm and they were taking away people from Israel and the slavery and other things. And he's crying out. And family, the church, we're in the same state. People are laughing at the church. People don't see the church as the voice that leads the nation. They laugh at us. 
And many of us in the church didn't even think that we were essential during COVID. Like, the church is a mockery right now. And do we understand that? And do we see that? And does that cause us to cry out and say, God, forgive us. Forgive us of our sins because we're really good at wanting to look at everyone else's sin but ours. Do we see our unbelief? Do we see the things that we're doing that make God angry? Because family, hear me this. God is love. Can I get an amen? And God is good. Can I get an amen? amen? And because of these truths, that makes Him holy and just. Which means He hates sin. He hates it. And family, because He hates sin, the church should hate sin. Amen? Can I get an amen? amen. We should hate sin. Not people. Sin. And family, sin angers God. It grieves God, hear me on this. There is a reason why He kicked our first parents out of the garden. The garden that all of us were created for. Sin angers Him. There's a reason why He flooded the entire earth. Sin angers Him. There's a reason why He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Sin angers Him. There's a reason why the Israelites who He led out of Egypt wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and He killed off that entire generation. Sin angers Him. There's a reason why here in Psalms 80, family, their food right now is tears and their drink right now is their own tears. Sin angers the Lord. Hebrews 10.31 says this, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. No one wants to die standing before God Almighty not covered in the blood of Jesus. That's what that Scripture is saying. Do you understand that His judgment's coming? That His wrath is being poured out? And if you stand before Him without the true shepherd standing there interceding for you, mediating for you with His blood on you, then family, what the Word of God is saying, you're damned. That you will face an angry God, not a God of grace. And family, there can be no revival without true repentance. Just as there can be no revival without prayer, it can't come about either without repentance. And if we truly want revival in this church and to see it throughout this nation, we've got to look at our own sins and own where we fall short and stop wanting to point the finger and look at what everyone else does wrong. Look at Nineveh. Nineveh, they were not Jews. God sent Jonah to destroy. He wanted to destroy Nineveh. Jonah's like, okay. I'll finally go if I see you destroy them. But what happened? They repented. And because they repented, what happened? The the city of Nineveh was transformed. Revival took place. And God showed them grace and spared their lives. And I think too many of us are like Jonah. We don't want to see people repent. We don't want to see revival. We want to see God pour His wrath on others. That's how the story of Jonah ends. He's angry. Angry that God would show grace and mercy. Not realizing God has spared his life in the well and showed him grace and mercy when he was in sin. We need to repent of that. Amen? And family, do we grasp that our sins grieve God in such a way that it causes Him to turn His face away? Do we see that? Do we see that God has turned His face away from this nation because of His people, His bride, His church? Now, He's purging the church like we've never seen in our life. And we're starting to find out who the remnant is. We're finding out who the real Christians are. But family, will you be among that? Will you be a part of that revival? Will you be a part of that great repentance that's taking place? Will we be like Judah? She's more righteous than I am. Because too many of us, again, are looking at other sins. Family, 2 Corinthians 7.10 says what? Godly grief leads to what? To repentance, to salvation, to life. Worldly grief leads to what? Death. 
We've got to ask ourselves this morning, when it comes to sin and where we fall short of the glory of God, are we truly grieved what we've done to God? Or is it a worldly grief? What can I do to cause people to not look at me so I can continue in my sin? Do we grasp that our sin brings judgment and the wrath of God upon us? Colossians 3, 5-6 through speaks of this. From sexual, sexual immorality, liars, gossip, so forth. Because of these things, the wrath of God is being poured out upon mankind. Do we grasp our sins crucified Jesus on the cross? That we're all guilty of putting Jesus on the cross. All of us. Too many of us think of our sins as little. And we need to repent of that thinking. Look right here at Romans chapter 2. I had to share this passage when I was in Cuba. Look right here, Romans chapter 2. And start right here in uh, verse 4. It says, Or do you presume on the riches of His kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your heart and impentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Family, God is right now is giving us time to repent. And you know what people are doing? Oh, look, I've been in sin. I don't see no judgment like that pastor said or like the, the, the Bible I just read. Clearly, God is okay with this sin. Yeah. Clearly, His judgment's never coming. Clearly, I can just do whatever I want. And family, everybody look up here at me. I'm telling you right now, whatever sin that you know that you are prone to and that you battle, repent. The reason why you're breathing, the reason why you're alive is because He's showing you grace. And He's giving you time to get out of it. And take that escape. Amen? Don't do what I just watched a brother who I love dearly that I preached with. Since 2015 too, while I was in Cuba. He didn't just walk away from the church. He didn't just walk away from his wife and kids. He walked away from Jesus. He's in sin. I called him to repentance. And here's, here's how good God is. The day that we were to fly out to go back home. Brother Greg spots him. He, he's trying to cover up so we can't see him. And man, I, I run up to the brother. I grab him. And I tell him before he walks out the door, brother, God, let me see you one more time. This is His grace. Repent. Repent before it's too late. Repent before you die in your sin. And he still walked out, still walked in his sin. And family, there's those of us that's where we're at right now. Are we going to repent? Are we going to stay in our sin? That's why David says in Psalms 19, Lord, help reveal the sins I can't see. My hidden faults that I don't know. Because family, we're all guilty of sins that we can't even see right now. We think we're good and God is like, no, you're not. And then he goes on in Psalms 19, and Lord, help me with the sins that I know I want to commit. Then we all know we've been guilty of that. Spouse makes us mad. Lord, forgive me because I'm about to sin. And God's like, I don't think so. That's, that's, that's not okay. Because we're all prone to wonder. That's why David says in Psalms 139, Lord, test me. Expose me. Help me to see the things that grieve you. Why? So that he can repent. So that he can be in right standing. And family, if we want to see God restore us, restore the church, we need to repent of our sins. Can I get an amen? amen. And then point three, O oh Lord, shine on us. Everyone say, O oh Lord, shine on us. We need to ask God to once again shine on us and on His church. And family, what that means is that in number 625, when, when they're, they're blessing the priest, Aaron, it says that the Lord would cause His face to shine upon us. 
In other words, what does that mean is that God would smile on His church once again. That, that God would smile on His nation once again. Israel. That He would smile upon His priest again. And we ought to be asking God that He would once again shine on us and shine on our church once again in His church throughout America. Amen? Amen. And family, this is, so just look right here going back to Psalms 80. And let's just read these three verses. Look at verse 7. Actually, starting in verse 3, it says, Restore us, O God, and let Your face shine. Everyone say, face shine. shine. That we may be saved. Verse 7, Restore us, O God of hosts. Let Your face shine that we may be saved. And then, verse 19, Restore us, O Lord, God of hosts. Let Your face shine that we may be saved. We need God to shine once again on the church. But family, for that to happen, we have to repent. And that's why the psalmist is like, Lord, how long will You be angry with us? How long will will our tears be our food and be our drink? Like, Lord, forgive us. It's what He's asking. And shine on us again. And He's also saying, remember Your Word. Everyone say, remember Your Word. Family, there's nothing wrong with reminding God of His Word. Can I get an amen? Amen. The Lord loves to be reminded of His promises and of His Word. Remind Him. It's not that He forgets. He doesn't forget, amen? But we see all throughout Scripture how the people of God will remind God of His Word. And He loves it. It's just like when my daughters remind me of what I've told them. I don't get upset. I get convicted sometimes because I'm like, oh, I didn't do that. But family, it moves me to action when they remind me, Dad, you said this. Dad, you promised this. This this is your own words. You're right. Now let me move to action. Because look right here in Psalms 80 how they're reminding God of His Word. Look right here at verse 8. It says, You brought a vine out of Egypt. And that's the Jews. They one time looked like, when we showed the, the, the beginning of, of what that car Paul was looking like, that's how they were looking like as, as slaves in Egypt. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it, and you took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shape, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea, and it shoots to the river, and... Why then have you broken down its walls so that all who pass along will pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it and all that move in the field feed on it. He's showing, God, this is what we once were and this is what we are now. Then verse 14, turn again. Shine on us again. Revive us again. O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see and have regard for this vine. And he's talking about, hey, here's what we once looked like, God. And here's where we now look like. Will you shine on us again? Would you re- restore us again? Revive us again? Help us to look good again. Would you smile again? Turn your Bibles and look right here at Exodus 32. Because this is what the psalmist is being reminded of here in Psalms 80. He's being reminded of, of Moses in Psalms 32. If you know, I mean, not Psalms, Exodus 32. If you know your Bibles, man, God brings the Jews out of Egypt, and he, Moses goes up to the top of the mountain. They're like, ah, Moses is taking his time. And these were stiff necked people who never really had godly grief, it was always worldly grief. And they said, man, we're going to build a calf for ourselves, and we're going to worship this calf, and we're going to say this is what brought us out of Egypt. And God is furious. God wants to just, He's like, I'm going to wipe out these people, and I'll just create a new people. And man, look how Moses reminds us of Jesus. Starting in verse 11. But, everyone say but. but. Woo, praise God for the buts in the Bible. Just keeping it real right now. <laughs> Moses implored the Lord God and said, Look, family, oh Lord. Everyone say, oh Lord. oh Lord. He's not just going, oh Lord. This is, he's on his knees. Oh Lord, God. 
Don't pour out your wrath like family. He's literally between God and between His people. Praise God, Jesus does the same for us. Amen? Why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did He bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn! Everyone say turn. turn. From your burning anger and relent. Everyone say relent. relent. From this disaster against your people. In other words, Lord, shine on us again. Have favor towards us again. Smile on us again. And then look at verse 13. Remember. Everyone say remember. It's okay to remind God of what His Word says. Amen? That's why we need to know His Word and memorize it. Amen? Amen. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that He has spoken to bringing on His People, family, God showed grace, God showed mercy, and He chose once again to shine on His people. And family, this is what needs to happen in the church, amen? And family, are we doing this? The leaders of this church, are we doing this for the people of this church? And the people of this church, are you doing this for your own families? And are we doing this for the nation? Not just our city, but for the nation. May we not be like Jonah and want to see everything just burn. Amen? And then point four, oh Lord, revive us. Everyone say, oh Lord, revive us. Because this is what he's saying. And it's how we see the church restored. Oh shepherd, we repent. Would you shine on us? Why? So that we can be revived, brought back to life. Psalm 71.20 says, revive me again. Everyone say, revive me again. Now, to be revived again means you got to be saved. Some of you, if you've never given your life to Jesus, you've never been revived. For the first time, you need to be revived. Amen? Amen. But if you've been a Christian long enough, you understand there's seasons of our life where we got to be brought back to life. Uh, what, what it made me think about was, uh, I mean, if you've ever seen when the, when the ambulance shows up and, and the person's got no pulse, and, and so what do they do? They, they, they put the things on them. <laughs> To do what? To, to trying to bring pulse, to trying to bring that person back. Yeah. This is what needs to happen to the Church of America family. Amen. We need to be brought back to life. We need to be revived. And family, only Jesus can do that. Can I get an amen? amen. It ain't going to happen any other way. And so family, our hearts need to be stirred up. They need to be awakened. You see the psalmist is saying, he, he, he's asking first, God, would you stir up and awaken? And now he's saying, that we would be stirred, that we would be awakened. It speaks of this in Isaiah 64, uh, 64 verse 7. That the Lord is looking for what? Those whose hearts are stirred up. Those whose hearts have realized, I'm a sinner. I need to repent. God, I need You to smile again on me. Revive me again. And they're running to God. They're running to the mercy seat. They're pleading and they're pulling on God. Look at me once again. And are we doing that? It also means returning the joy of thy salvation. Family, when David sinned, what did he need more than anything? The joy of his salvation returned. He needed to be revived again. Jeremiah 29, verses 12-13, through it means seeking God with all of our hearts. Why? That He might be found. It's not that God is lost. He's there. But He's only going to revive those whose hearts are stirred up. Those who will seek Him and who will count the cost no matter what. Amen? And family, that we would long and have an expectation to see God's glory and holiness and presence in the church again. Amen? Amen. That is what this world needs to see. Amen? It needs to see a holy and powerful church. Look at someone and say, a holy and powerful church. It's what the world needs to see. It's what America needs to see. And here's what a powerful, 
Holy Revived Church looks like. It's charging the gates of hell. It's preaching the Word of God. It's reaching souls. It's making disciples. It's transforming the community, the city, and the nation by the power of the Gospel message of Christ crucified and risen. And it's influencing culture instead of culture influencing the church. Greatest tragedy in the church today, it's the world influencing us. Culture is influencing us instead of us being the ones who influence for example, I've had people tell me, don't celebrate what happened Friday. It, our culture says don't do that. I don't care what the culture says. I'm doing what the Word of God says. I'm going to celebrate. Amen? Amen. That means that Jesus and His gospel message is why people are flocking to the church. That's what real revival looks like. People aren't flocking to the church because, oh, wow, look at their fog lights. Look how big of a church they have. Look at the great singers they have, or, man, look at the children's ministry. They have this incredible playground. No, people are coming to church because they're being convicted by God Himself. And they therefore long to hear the Word of God. They long to be in His presence. They don't care if the church is falling apart. They don't care if it's made of dirt. They just want to hear the Word and be in His presence. That's just what I was seeing at one of the churches in Cuba. They just long to be in His presence. That's revival. And family, it, it, revival also is salvations everywhere by the hundreds. By the grace of God, He's letting this church see a lot of salvations lately, family. But everybody look up here at me. We still haven't seen revival. We're, we're just getting little bits. Family, revival is like we're, we're, we're talking hundreds. Just everywhere you go, people are getting saved. No one person can take any credits. It's just one of those things where you go, but God, and He's just supernaturally doing what only God can do. Yeah. And don't tell me He can't do it. We just saw Him overturn something. Uh, uh, we just saw Him overturn Roe that was taken versus way that had been taking place for 49 years. Family, I just had somebody in the church call me convicted in their house. No sermon. God just showed up and convicted this beautiful sister in her house. Don't tell me God can't do this stuff. Amen? God can do anything and we need to long for it and ask for it. And so on the last point, and as we close out, point five, O oh Lord, save us. Everyone say, O oh Lord, save us. The shortest prayer in the Bible was Peter. Man, Peter is experiencing God like none of us have ever experienced him. He walked on water. I know all of you in here, and not a single one of you have ever walked on water, including me. The brother walked on water. And as he's walking on water, he takes his eyes off of Jesus. Because he's seeing the waves. He's seeing the storms. And there's those of us in this church right now, that's where we're at. We ain't walking on water. We are drowning. Because we've taken our eyes off of Jesus. All we can see is everything that's going on around us. Oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? Oh my gosh, look at this. Oh my gosh, they're doing this. They're doing... And, 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 and we're just drowning. And what does Peter do? He cries out, save me. Save me. He didn't have time for a long prayer, family. It will save me or I drown and I die. And what did Jesus do? He stretches out His hand and He saves him. He pulls him out. He rescues him, restores him, revives him once again. And this is what the psalmist is asking. Look, look right here. He's asking that the true shepherd would save them. Look right here starting in verse 17 of Psalm 80. But let your hands, family, this is a prophecy about Jesus. But let your hand be on the man of your right hand. Who sits at the right hand of the Father? Jesus, the true shepherd, the Son of Man, whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back. Notice what will keep us from sinning, what will revive the church, what will bring us back to looking like what we're supposed to? Jesus! Amen. Not ideology, not politics, not a constitution, not this or that. It's Jesus. Give us life 
and we will call upon Your name. Restore us, O Lord, God of hosts, and let Your face shine that we may be saved. Family, we're in trouble. I see it. Marriages are in more trouble than I've ever seen. Families are more in trouble than I've ever seen. The church is in trouble. We're getting threats like we've never had threats. And there's only one who can save us. Jesus. There's only one who can save you from your own sins. From your own sins that you're prone to wander into. Jesus. The true shepherd. He starts off crying out to the true shepherd. Ends with recognizing Jesus, only You can revive. Only You can save us from what's ahead and from us being a laughing stock. And so I ask us this morning, will we cry out to the true Savior? Will we cry out to Jesus? Will we ask Him to forgive us and to revive us? And will we long for revival until our last breath? Will we cry out for revival in His church until our last breath? Because family, even though we might be in the last days, even though... All hell is breaking loose. We're promised revival. And are we calling on it and asking for it? And are we desperate for it? And if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, are you asking Him to save you for the very first time so you can taste and see how good He is and experience Him for the first time? Let's bow our heads and let's pray.